right. Uh, I'm Alexander Rose. I'm the executive director here at Long Now, and uh, thank you all for coming out on this very warm October, uh, almost October, I guess, uh, evening. Um, I think actually my connection to Greg started, I think, long before even Greg maybe knows it, uh, but the very first survival research laboratory show I ever saw uh, when I was in high school was here in Fort Mason um, out in this parking lot. And it kind of changed my brain. Um, and uh, I'd grown up in a junkyard in Sausalito and uh, building things. And I saw these you know, destructive robot theater. Uh, and it, it was something that I, I kind of knew I was going to be connected to in the thread through the rest of my life. And um, I did a very short stint uh, with them a little bit in, when I was in high school, but then went on to build robots for BattleBots and, and things like that. But several of the people who work on the clock project, like Chris Rand, also at some point worked for uh, survival research laboratories. And then um, when uh, Jim Mason started Power Tool Drag Races, uh, which was uh, drag races with tools or racers made out of uh, handheld power tools, um, I was competing in that. And then Greg showed up with this wild box that was labeled like bajillion volts on it and like hooked it up to this saw and completely smoked the whole class of everybody else. And like everyone realized that they were dealing with a different species of uh, kind of, uh, of competitor. And um, so I've been paying attention ever since and I've seen a lot of the, the Tesla coils um, that he's worked on and, and brought to various shows. Uh, and so when I heard that he had a, um, some theories on lightning and new ways to test out those theories, uh, I became really interested and uh, Michael was uh, really great in bringing this uh, talk together and working with Greg on this. So um, without anything further, I'm gonna ha uh, he's going, Greg's going to uh, do uh, a fair amount of explanation of uh, some of the work that he's doing as well as the ongoing projects and then, uh, and then I'm going to come up and we'll have a little bit of conversation afterwards. Greg. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, the study of large-scale electrical physics is an active hobby of mine. It's endlessly fascinating and surprisingly unexplored. I started this work way back when three-letter URLs were free for the taking. <laughs> So uh, visit LOD.org if you want to know more details about my research. Tonight I'd like to talk about three interesting electrical effects, all of which only occur on large physical scales. Uh, Tesla's wireless power scheme, super long discharges, and uh, relativistic effects in lightning, such as the role that Einstein's special relativity plays during lightning formation. Nikola Tesla was an inventor who probably needs no introduction in this room. Although Tesla is best known for his invention of the AC induction motor, he spent a great deal of his life uh, working towards sending power around the world without wires. Tesla's idea was to place a number of high voltage towers at strategic points around the globe. Each tower would then capacitively couple power up to uh, the upper atmosphere, which Tesla believed to be reasonably conductive. Uh, he based this on his work with uh, rarefied gases in vacuum tubes. It's also interesting uh, that Tesla developed this whole scheme several decades before the ionosphere was discovered. No doubt Tesla would have been ecstatic to find out that there was already a pre-ionized uh, atmospheric layer up there. In 1899, Tesla started working on the drive system for its towers. Um, this 51-foot diameter fence around the outside is actually the primary and secondary coil. Uh, they drive uh, this tertiary coil here, which produces most of the voltage. And there's Tesla sitting there. Uh, he's rather proud of this uh, double exposure that he did. Although everybody back east in the media kind of lost uh, the notion that it was a double exposure. And <laughs> then they just think he was crazy. 
Uh, this tertiary coil here also sends high voltage up to a raised aerial on the roof of the building, uh, which Tesla used for measuring coupling to the upper atmosphere. After finishing the drive system in Colorado Springs, uh, he started construction of this 187-foot-tall tower uh, at Mordencliffe on Long Island. This mushroom-shaped uh, metal structure on top is the high-voltage electrode, which would uh, couple power towards the sky. Unfortunately, Tesla ran out of money halfway through the project and uh, never got to throw the switch. Ultimately, uh, Wardenclyffe was torn down and scrapped in uh, 1915 to satisfy Tesla's creditors. So would it have worked? There's plenty of arguments on both sides, even today. Personally, I was a skeptic. Um, after all, radio transmitters today are far more powerful than Wardenclyffe, yet they only deliver fractions of a microwatt to receiver antennas. So how could Wardenclyffe possibly deliver kilowatts? But then one day, I witnessed a bizarre electrical accident. I actually caused this accident <laughs> <laughs> by leaving this poor cliff lead connected across the primary terminals of a coil. But what's interesting here is that when the coil burned this cliff lead, the coil itself was disconnected from everything and actually stored away in the corner of the lab. At the time, we were running a similar coil across the room uh, when somebody started yelling about smoke. After finding the smoldering clip lead uh, hanging from the disconnected coil, I just stared at it for a long moment in disbelief and wondering, what in the hell just happened? So, of course, the first thing we did was try to recreate the accident. <clears throat> we pulled the stored coil out and set it up here as the receiving coil, and the other coil we set up as the transmitting coil. And both these coils are tuned to the same frequency. And instead of a clip lead, we gave the receiving coil 800 watts worth of light bulbs as a test load. Now, I thought 800 watts would be more than enough, but the receiving coil could actually drive these way beyond 800 watts if the transmitting coil got any closer than five meters. This made no sense to me at all, uh, since the electric coupling between these two coils is so incredibly small. It, it measured about 10 femtofarads, which is one one hundredth of a millionth of a millionth of a farad. <laughs> but later I ran some detailed circuit simulations, uh, which confirmed that even this amazingly small amount of coupling can pass uh, dangerous amounts of power between well, uh, two well-tuned Tesla coils, all through the magic of resonance. After this discovery, a friend, uh, Mike Kennan, uh, felt rather strongly that light bulbs were a terrible choice for a test load. He thought this effect should be used to push his lazy butt around. <laughs> so he built the, first wor the world's first real Tesla Roadster. There, there's an aerial up here, and this aerial consists of a bunch of welding rods that form a disk shape, and that establishes an area where it can collect electric field lines that ultimately come from the transmitting coil. That energy goes down here to a little resonant transformer mounted on the frame. And this transformer can be quite small because the operating frequency is so high. The transformer steps down the voltage to about 200 volts or so and runs this 180 volt gear motor over here. And then the gear motor is just linked to, to the drive axle under the seat. That's all it is. Here's a short video clip of the Tesla Roadster in action at a Maker Fair a while back. Note that Mike is wearing uh, heavy welding gloves. He kept complaining about getting shocks from holding the steering grips. It's too bad we didn't collect the energy from him as well. Oh, when the cart starts moving, uh, you can see some lively sparking down here from the grounding chain that uh, drags behind the roadster.
He could have kept going around and around, but we had all this other stuff in the way. These little carts that are rotating in place are smaller prototypes of Tesla Roadsters that whenever the electric field's high enough, they just start spinning in circles. So, would Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower have worked? For near field applications, absolutely. Even the accidental rig uh, that we had could deliver over a horsepower. A machine the size of Wardenclyffe could easily deliver 30 horsepower to local loads in the area. What about far field coupling to the ionosphere and beyond? Uh, my intuition still says no. But then again, you could say my intuition has already been burned once uh, by my experience with this. In fact, uh, Tesla could have hosted uh, wireless drag races at Wardenclyffe over 100 years ago. More recently, however, a number of groups have tried to answer this question with computer simulations to simulate the entire cavity between the ionosphere and the Earth. And, uh, but it's a huge problem. A simulation of this size presents over 10 billion degrees of freedom. So nobody's quite gotten there yet. Being an experimentalist, however, um, I'm convinced that the fastest way to get at these answers will be simply to build a resonator tall enough to actually test the idea. So what other strange things might Tesla have discovered if he was able to throw the switch on Warden Cliff? One very likely and completely unexpected result would have been super long discharges. No doubt Tesla would have been fascinated by these, even as they short-circuited the output of his tower and destroyed nearby equipment. <laughs> what do we mean by super-long discharges? Well, if we want to make a regular spark in the laboratory, and we have some suitable high-voltage machine, classical electrical theory states that it'll cost us about 2,000 kilovolts per meter in order to break down the air and make a nice arc discharge. The cost of breaking down air is well documented, and um, modern electrical insulators depend on this 2,000 kilovolts per meter value to successfully hold off voltages. However, super long discharges are a completely different beast. They use some trick to reach across huge distances uh, far greater than 2,000 kilovolts per meter would normally allow. The first man made super long discharge occurred in the uh, 1960s at a high voltage test facility in Siberia, uh, the one shown in this photo. This tower here on the left is called a Marx generator. This one's about 90 feet tall and can produce about 5 million volts. Now normally, 5 million volts should only arc about this far at 2,000 kilovolts per meter. And you can see the designers of the tower had that in mind. So imagine their surprise when arcs started coming out of the top of this tower and shooting across hundreds of meters. In this case, across the field, hitting this transmission line, uh, blowing out the insulators on the top of the tower, and even hitting the, the street lights in the parking lot next to the building. These wild arcs somehow managed to cross these huge distances with less than 100 kV per meter. That's only a 20th of what normal arcs uh, require. I hate to say this, but uh, we still don't know how super long uh, discharges uh, pull off this trick. We do know that it only happens at many millions of volts and in wide open areas. This would be, uh, this would be a really great trick to understand, however, since these uh, wild arcs ultimately limit the things we can do. As fascinating as they were, these super long discharges ultimately killed uh, the researchers' plans 
to develop multi-megavolt transmission lines. And because of this, one million volts is about as high as transmission lines can go these days. Now, the reason this is sad is because transmission lines need about 1,000 volts per mile of length in order to be efficient. So a million volt line can only span about 1,000 miles. However, a 10 million volt line would be able to start connecting the continents together. So understanding how to control wild arcs at multi-megavolt levels would allow renewable energies like solar to become cost competitive because then you could build huge solar plants and they could uh, send power uh, directly to the dark side of the planet. 45 years later, uh, the forests have reclaimed most of the towers at uh, the, the, the facility in Siberia, uh, but the mysteries behind super long discharges remain. There's also another form of super long discharges uh, which present us with a completely different set of problems. Storm clouds also have some trick to initiate very long discharges with surprisingly weak electric fields. The fields actually measured inside storm clouds are only about 50 to 200 kV per meter, a small fraction of the classic 2,000 kV per meter normally needed to break down air. It's really odd to think that in the 21st century, we still don't know what this trick is. However, a couple Russian physicists uh, named Gurevich and Zyvin came up with a novel theory to explain this and they gave it a great name to boot. Relativistic runaway breakdown. <laughs> Their theory starts with an electric field in the middle of a cloud, arranged at some arbitrary angle. Usually they're mostly vertical. Now this field doesn't have to be strong enough to break down air. It only has to be strong enough to accelerate free electrons. A cosmic ray enters the electric field area and strikes an atom. Under the right conditions, if it hits it just right, uh, the cosmic ray will knock off electrons at relativistic velocities. Now, a curious property of relativistic electrons is that they're moving so fast that they actually shrink, they effectively shrink due to their warped space-time, which significantly reduces their friction in air. This allows them to, to accelerate to near the speed of light until they eventually do hit other atoms and knock off more relativistic electrons, eventually starting a, a chain reaction. Now, the theory predicts that if the electric field reaches a critical strength of 200 kV per meter and spans a critical distance of 80 meters, then this avalanche can build up enough to the point where it can start a classical lightning discharge. So in the late 1990s, Researchers, uh, <coughs> researchers started uh, searching storm clouds for telltale gamma rays that would uh, lend support to the theory. But for many years, they couldn't find anything at all. It turns out they were looking from the wrong direction. About 10 years later, NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope made an amazing accidental discovery described here in this video. thunderstorms are in progress somewhere on the globe. New observations by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope show that thunderstorms make antimatter. The process starts with a terrestrial gamma ray flash, or TGF, an intense pulse of gamma rays originating from thunderstorms. These dots mark TGFs observed by Fermi's gamma ray burst monitor during the spacecraft's first eight months of operations. Researchers estimate that there may be as many as 500 TGFs each day. On December 14, 2009, as Fermi passed over Egypt, it spotted a TGF produced by a thunderstorm in Zambia. The TGF was over the spacecraft's horizon where Fermi couldn't see it. So how could Fermi have detected it? Scientists believe that the TGF process begins in a thunderstorm's intense electrical field 
electrons within this field become accelerated upward. Above the storm, where the air is thin, the electrons can ramp up to speeds nearly as fast as the speed of light. When these ultra-fast electrons encounter an atom, they emit gamma rays. Very rarely, one of these gamma ray photons grazes an atom and transforms into a pair of particles. One, an electron, is normal matter. The other is antimatter, the electron's opposite, called a positron. The gamma rays travel in straight lines, but the charged particles spiral along lines of Earth's magnetic field. And that was the route to Fermi. The particles created by the TGF rode upward on magnetic field lines and then struck the spacecraft. The positrons annihilated when they struck electrons in Fermi, creating a flash of gamma rays. For an instant, Fermi became a gamma ray source and set off its own detectors. A fraction of a second later, some of the particles were bounced back along the same magnetic field line. They again passed through Fermi and again produced gamma rays. The spacecraft has observed this phenomenon on at least four other occasions. So the next time lightning flashes and thunder roars, remember, you may be witnessing antimatter in the making. So, oh, thunderstorms really do produce both gamma rays and antimatter. But the Fermi discovery raised more questions than answers. Why do the gamma rays head upwards rather than down? Are there other effects at work here that we haven't considered? And perhaps most importantly, are there ways that we could hack this fantastic gain mechanism? It would be incredibly useful, for instance, if we had the ability to turn off lightning over populated areas. These answers have eluded us for decades, since floating around with instruments at the exact right place and right time inside a storm cloud is practically impossible. Now, I wonder if anyone here looking at this problem has had the same thought as me, that the best way to get at these answers is to simply recreate this critical electric field here on the ground, where we can actually measure what happens in close detail. Now, an electric field that's 200,000 volts per meter and 80 meters in length is only about 16 million volts total from end to end. So I've spent a lot of effort working on possible ways to generate such a field. And I'm happy to report that it's not completely crazy to do. The most practical approach I've found so far is to set up two 120-foot tall Tesla towers spaced about 300 feet apart. <clears throat> At just 8 million volts per tower, oppositely phased, the space between the towers can produce the critical field needed to uh, start relativ relativistic runaway breakdown. Now, modern structural plastics that you would make these towers out of um, only support about 7,000 volts per inch outdoors, and that's if they're well cared for. So each tower needs to be a minimum of about 12 stories in height to, to support this much voltage. This height also places the runaway breakdown zone safely above the ground, where it's easier to view with instruments. Here's a few interesting numbers that fall out of the full-scale machine design. The design target uh, for the output voltage is actually about 20% higher than the minimum 16 MV required by the theory. And that's because, historically, large electrical machines and large research machines always encounter some intriguing corner case that's just out of reach. And I know many times, including the Tevatron, where they wish they could turn it to 11. <laughs> um, the primary drive system for each tower uh, includes 12 stations. And each station has an array of the largest 6,500 volt transistors available in order to produce this uh, aggregate primary drive current. Now, we're used to processors containing millions of transistors. But a single one of these transistors is the size of a phone book. Uh, the transistors that we'll use here 
are currently used to power high-speed electric trains. So to show that a 121-foot tall Tesla coil isn't completely crazy, I thought I should demonstrate a one-third scale model of one tower. So for the last five years, I've been building this 40-foot tall, fully functional scale prototype. Now, even this scaled prototype will be more than twice as large as the largest operating Tesla coil ever built. So for me to build this without any funding, uh, this prototype necessarily explores new design ideas that significantly reduce the cost of construction and operation. Among these are a fully collapsible tower design and a modular, massively parallel primary drive system. To give you a rough idea of what this coil might look like running at uh, 240,000 watts, here's a short clip of a coil that I built about 20 years ago running at about 80,000 watts. This coil was called Electrum, and I built it as an art project for the Gibbs Art Farm in New Zealand. Um, Electrum is currently the, the world's largest Tesla coil. In this clip, you can see Electrum reaching out to a street light that was unfortunately uh, located too close to the tower. <laughs> a kinetic sculpture artist by the name of Eric Orr asked if I could make his new sculpture produce 50-foot electrical discharges into the air. I, of course, quit my day job and immediately started on the design. The result was a four-story high sculpture concealing a 130,000-watt Tesla coil, the largest of its kind in the world. At full power, the arc discharges reach up to 50 feet from the top Electra. The unusual scale of Electra allows a person to actually stand inside the electrode at full power. Aside from being incredibly fun, Riding the electrode at millions of volts provided a rare educational experience. <laughs> the new 40-foot tower will run at about three times this output power. Here's how the new 40-foot uh, coil tower looks now in its uh, fully collapsed state. Uh, the secondary winding breaks into eight parts, and they're all nested here on top of each other. The entire machine is about 95% uh, complete now. However, this photo was taken at a key moment. Uh, the coil is leaving the lab space for the last time and going to a storage facility. I recently lost uh, my lab space here that I've had for the last eight years uh, when real estate developers from New York bought the entire American Steel site you might imagine their response upon seeing my workspace for the first time. I knew I was in trouble when one of them asked, will all of this stuff affect my DNA? <laughs> so I was promptly kicked out, uh, along with many other workshops and artists there, including uh, Gary Wilson and uh, Karen Cusolito, the artist who actually founded American Steel Studios. Now, eight years ago, it was pretty easy to find another industrial space. But nowadays, even undesirable spots like American Steel are being scooped up by developers. So right now, everything's in storage, and the project is pretty much dead in the water. But I have a plan to replace this lab space with one that can avoid the hazards of gentrification. The plan is to get a custom cargo trailer and outfit it with all the tower components, instruments, and a workshop. Since the tower itself is fully collapsible, uh, the entire system can pack into a single 18-foot trailer. There's many great desolate spots around the Bay Area that would make perfect test sites, <laughs> but they don't have usable buildings or utilities. However, a self-contained mobile lab could just roll into one of these sites, set up, perform experiments, and then roll out. <laughs> All without needing any building space, administrative overhead, or hookups. Storing a trailer is also much, much easier than finding reliable lab space in Oakland these days. So right now, 
the new 40-foot Tesla tower is almost ready to fire up, but everything's in storage until the uh, mobile lab is ready. In order to get the 18-foot cargo trailer, I started a fundraiser at LOD.org. To make the fundraiser interesting, I've added some unusual perks, like frozen lightning, uh, an Electrum documentary by Alberta Chu, and a special high-power demo of the 40-foot coil when it's ready. It's been 10 years since I've hosted a public demo, so maybe it's time for one more. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, check out the fundraiser. And it's at uh, LOD.org. At this point, uh, I guess I'd like to open the floor to Xander. We're just going to do a little bit of stage change here. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, Greg. Uh, I, I, I mentioned SRL, and I know that you've worked with them a little bit, and so I didn't really close that loop. Um, but I, you know, the, the early forms of survival research labs um, were very much about um, kind of pirate science as well. And uh, um, yes. now, now you're, you're creating your own savage engineering. Of, pirate ship for science, uh, uh, for lightning science, and did, was your work with them uh, kind of, did that inspire some of this thinking, or is it just really based on necessity of Oh, uh, clearly, lack of yeah. Space? Um, yeah, working with SRL allows one to experience social scenarios that you don't normally get to experience. Um, and, to, you know, to discover that the, the fabric that society is made out of is actually kind of fragile and goes away in certain places. I wasn't there uh, with Mark, but uh, I remember one story where he needed a, uh, a big winch that was out at the, in a railroad yard somewhere. And uh, so he went out to get it and uh, started unbolting it just in broad daylight. And the police came by and said, hey, what are you doing? He said, I'm taking this railroad winch. I need it for a performance. And uh, they said, well, you can't do that. Get out of here. So they ran him off. And, and they were just uh, flabbergasted that he was doing it in broad daylight as if he deserved it as an artist. Yes, well, the yeah, coiner of the term obtainium, as far as I know. Um, and I'm, I, I think what's, what's also interesting is that, I mean, you're, you're trying to get to a fundamental in uh, a very common, what's obviously a common phenomenon, of, of lightning that is amazing that we don't understand. And um, it always seems in these cases that an obscure Russian research paper is the answer. Um, and um, how did you come across this theory and where, where, did, you, uh, where did you find it? Oh, well, I, I monitor geophysics, especially anything having to do with uh, natural electrical phenomena, uh, like the global electrical circuit, uh, sprites, uh, things like that. And uh, they, they uh, published it a little bit earlier, but they published it widely in 2005. And my first reaction to that was, I can't imagine gamma rays coming out of a lightning storm, because that's a very classical effect, right? And then later on, when Dwyer added the supplement of positrons, I said, OK, I'm not going to believe that antimatter comes out of lightning storms. That's just too much. But then uh, Fermi happened, and uh, everybody's still scratching their heads. Interesting. Um, and I, I think what's also really interesting here, and I think gets this to a kind of a global impact, is this idea that, um, that by kind of cracking some of this phenomena, some of our problems, such as energy storage, um, where you can bring power to the other side of the world, uh, really um, starts changing the landscape of our entire power infrastructure. Uh, is, have you, uh, in your normal work, I know that you've worked in some of these spaces. Do you want to talk a little bit about, about that and uh, how uh, some of these alternative energy powers might be affected by that? Oh, yeah. Well, right now, um, well, I used to work at McConney, and they make uh, these, these special windmills that actually eight-bladed acrobatic planes that circle on a yeah, some of you remember Saul Griffith, who's speaking and spoken twice in our other series. He's the founder of McConaughey. Right. Yeah. And uh, 
the thing holding back renewables right now is storage. Uh, the cost of storage is just too much. So you end up with places like in Germany where they had so much, they, they had a perfect storm of solar and wind to where the price of electricity went negative because they couldn't ship it anywhere. And uh, that problem is going to get worse and worse as more solar comes online. However, um, if you had some way of selling that power directly to dark or calm areas where the price of electricity is high, uh, then suddenly it makes sense and uh, they become competitive with other forms like natural gas. Right, I mean, an intercontinental electric grid would yes. change the landscape considerably. Mm -hmm. We already do that in the United States where we ship power from hot, hot places to cold places and from one time zone to the next. But, yeah, the uh, biggest line in the U.S. right now is the Pacific Intertie. It comes from the hydroelectric plants in Washington and feeds Los Angeles. Right. Los Angeles is, just draws it in from everywhere. And that's a one million volt DC line at 2,500 amps. And uh, that's about as high as I go. And that, that just makes the run from Washington to Los Angeles. Right. I remember the, uh, the coal-fired power plant that was going to go up near Gerlach, Nevada, was also going to feed uh, L.A. as well through one of those D.C. electric lines. And mm. uh, when it took L.A. saying they didn't want to add that to the playa uh, for them to not build that. But, um, and the, why, do you, why do you think you're um, kind of alone in this space? And I mean, why is, where's, where's the NASA research lab that's, that's doing this? I mean, I know that you work uh, you know, for modern tech companies in your day job doing high voltage research. So, you know, there's obviously need for your amazing skills, but um, nobody's trying to figure out the fundamentals of lightning or the worldwide power grid, uh, strangely. Um, well, NASA's busy doing EM power and things like that that violate basic physics. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to look at what people are interested in, just go to Kickstarter or Indiegogo and look at the things that are raising all the money. It's like for a little clip-on for your iPhone. Or... Nobody's really interested in you know, pure research. N not like they used to be. There's so many other things to think about and do and, and excel at. Right. Yeah, no, I th and we were talking about this earlier, but um, from I remember a conversation with Saul Griffith. He, he basically kind of reverse engineered that the Google research budget is now larger than DARPA's. Um, and um, but yeah. clearly they're looking for different kinds of wins uh, than DARPA would be in peer research. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's an interesting problem when you have uh, I think people, especially from the software background, working in the physical sciences um, and hopefully looking for the same kind of scaling effects. Yeah, software people working in physics are kind of like a fish out of water. It's, it's um, like, what do you mean I can't undo that? <laughs> Um, all right, well, I'd like to open this up uh, for questions. Um, and we have a microphone because we have people tuned in from our online audience. So please do wait for the, the microphone. So raise your hand and Michael here will um, get a mic microphone to you. Andrew. Um, one of the uh, weirdest Wikipedia articles I've ever stumbled upon was ball lightning. Historic phenomenon with all these uh, different accounts of lightning, like entering a room, going around, and then leaving a room. Um, I was just wondering if there's current science on it or if you had a take on it. Well, a lot of that's hard to unwind. The anecdotal evidence, uh, sometimes it's just persistence of vision, where there was a flash where it hit the ground. That was in their retina, just off the center of vision. And so as they try to look at it, it wanders. Uh, that's one explanation. Um, other than that, there, there hasn't been much progress. However, you can make uh, plasmoids in your microwave oven. Have you ever tried that? <laughs> you mean putting a metal fork in your microwave and turning it on? Well, not a metal fork. That'll, that'll spark, but yeah. <laughs> that's not what you want. You take like a ceramic cup and turn it upside down and then find some thin carbon mesh. They call it carbon veil and put a little strip in there on top of the thing and set the microwave oven don't on. Don't do this in our microwave upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep going. Yeah, you, you don't want to use it in a, you don't want to do this in one that you normally cook food in. Because 
And what you'll get are these balls of plasma about this big around. They're like orange-white. And they'll just start floating around in there going... And they're, they're, they're balls of conductive material because they're humming at, at the 60 hertz that the magnetron is running at. And inevitably, they, since they're lighter in air, they hit the ceiling, they bounce off the ceiling, and before long, all of the paint is peeled off the top of the... <laughs> yeah. Right. So but, don't try it at home, try it in somebody else's home. Yeah. And, yeah. And, <laughs> and I don't have a good explanation for them. Uh, it, I, I haven't looked deeply for one. It's just one of those, just one of those things. <laughs> uh, at the bar. Okay, my question goes back to the beginning of your talk with Tesla's transmission experiment. He had one tower. What was the phenomenon he was hoping to see that would show that his idea was working? Uh, it's unclear to me. He had plans to set up another tower in the UK somewhere. And it'd be a smaller one just to listen. So he was actually trying to get that signal all the way across the Atlantic. He was trying to get power across the Atlantic. Yeah. He had told JP Morgan that it was going to be a radio station. <laughs> And that's kind of how things fell apart. <laughs> nice. Do you have any other questions? Still over here? Yes. Hi. I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of pushback from big oil and maybe now what might be called big wind and big hydro. But how, as a community, can we help the pro progression of this type of research when there's so much opposition um, with big money? Well, he has an Indiegogo campaign right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you can fund that. Uh, but I'll let, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, are you, do you feel as though you're hitting resistance so much as just apathy? More apathy. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've talked with a number of institutions and people about doing this research, and several are very excited. And they say, as soon as you have it built, we want to <laughs> come and do research. Uh, very few... Uh, Philanthropic organizations want to give out capital equipment money. Gotcha. Um, we've got a question from the live stream uh, about um, someone who saw the Marx generator at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Um, I, I think this is many years back, where they would split two by fours with lightning, sending a huge thunderclap through the museum. Um, where do Marx and Cockcroft Walton generators fit into this work? Is that the, can you tell us what those are and are they a similar thing or something that yeah. gets there for a different technology? Um, Marx generators can generate millions of volts and if you load them up with capacitance, they'll split two by fours. A Cockcroft Walton generator is a little bit different. Um, a Marx generator works by charging a bunch of capacitors in parallel and then you have some means to suddenly connect them in series and they form a high voltage. Whereas a Colcroft Walton, um, you're using diodes arranged in a zigzag all the way up the capacitors, and it acts like a bucket brigade, and it just shuttles uh, a charge all the way to the top. And over some amount of time, it charges up to full voltage. And, uh, both of these schemes can make millions of volts. Um, however, I want to make eight million volts, but I have to do it cheaply. A Marx generator per volt uh, cost way more than a, a Tesla coil because if you make the Tesla coil right, it's mostly air. It's just a winding that does this. Whereas the, the Marx bank has all these capacitors all the way up there, so it's a structure that holds a lot of weight, and that structure also has to be a good insulator. Very expensive. Is that what that structure, back, again, back to Russia, there was that structure that, um, that Russia built that looked like a whole series of diodes going up in, and I think you talked about it at one point when we were first talking about this talk, that it, it ended up being too close to some grounding source. Um. Oh, the, uh, the big white tower? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was a Marx generator. Uh, it was a bunch of capacitors. I think that one had uh, oh, 90 or 100 stages in series. And then uh, the spark gaps we're all lined up through the center. If you get up in there and look at it, it looks really cool because it's just this vanishing point of spark gaps. 
And they're all lined up in series because when the first one flashes, they fall in a chain reaction. The ultraviolet light from one of them lands on the electrodes of the other and actually helps break it down. And you also mentioned about turning off lightning, um, which I thought was interesting. I was just out at the clock site um, where we're building the clock, and we have a big, huge uh, crane tower at the top um, that's attached to all of us humans, effectively, because we're all on the crane platform. And whenever there was lightning within five miles, we had to stop working. Um, and, um, and obviously, lightning causes destruction around the world on some level and fires, forest fires, um, for better or worse, depending on where you are. W what Do you think that there's a, a plausible scenario for being able to control lightning on that level? I, I think it's worth looking at, because uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, lightning uses this gain mechanism. It doesn't have enough field to generate lightning to start, but this relativistic electron avalanche has a net gain. And usually something like that that has gain, it's pretty easy to wreck it. And uh, all you have to do is wreck it to uh, wreck its stop gain that chain to, to, to stop the chain reaction and to and stop the lightning. Is that theory the widely accepted theory at this point, or is that uh, still a fairly? Uh, it, it's one edge of the main. Uh, Gurevich and Zybin's uh, runaway breakdown is one of the main contenders. However, it doesn't explain a few things. Apparently, it doesn't have quite enough gain uh, to actually start a real lightning strike, which is anywhere from 30,000 to 120,000 amps. Um, however, uh, Dwyer came up with a really novel mechanism where the gamma rays facing downwards uh, can produce uh, positron electron pairs, just like in the NASA video, but heading downwards. And if you make a positron in that electric field, it heads back upstream because it's positively charged. And his theory is it can make it upstream far enough to where it eventually does hit something and annihilates it'll produce more relativistic electrons upstream again, and it forms kind of this positronic feedback loop that could greatly increase the current in the uh, avalanche. And that, that was the again, point where residents. I said, no, I, I can't believe positrons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that you're trying to prove it in another theory. Can, can you explain a little bit more about your design? Um, so you showed the collapsed version uh, of your coil, but it infl can you explain how it in, in flights and uh, how, how, how that works and how you arrived at design, what some of the advantages are to how you're doing it? Yeah, well, essentially I needed a four-story structure that can hold a winding five feet in diameter all the way up there plus a big top electrode. And the cheapest way to make a structure is to use all tension elements. Don't use any compression elements. Like in airplanes, they try to make everything as tension as much as possible. Like a, like a stretched skin wing. Um, so the main structure in the center is an inflatable cylinder. And everything's in tension, uh, except for the air, which is in the middle that's under compression. There's nothing else in there. It's just all air. And uh, so you're using basically modern uh, jumpy house technology. That's right. This, right? <laughs> in, in, in fact, uh, the fabric. The, the fabric is straight out of bounce houses. We will learn how lightning works because of bouncy houses. And, <laughs> and, and can we what, get the what, mic up front right here? What, what's even more remarkable is that entire 40-foot uh, tower, I managed to get that through the sewing machine in my house oh, wow. to sew it all together. So by some amazing feat of topology, it all fit through there, <laughs> opening this big. So after listening to this brilliant man talk about his life's work, is there not someone in San Francisco, in this room or listening online, considering how interesting it is and how important it is, isn't there someone who can fund this trivial amount of money that he's looking for? I sure hope so. People with real money have safeguards against too much fun. <laughs> Daniel. Um, so as long as we're talking about uh, lightning suppression, what about the converse? What about, what about uh, like energy harvesting from lightning? And is there any serious thought there? Is it just, just overwhelm anything that the lightning is trying? Lightning is really hard to get a handle on. It's at this really awkward impedance. It's very high voltage I and mean, also high current, but really high voltage. And you have maybe 350 million volts there that you can harvest. 
So to, to get any appreciable amount of that, you have to build a tower that can store 350 million volts. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to make, say, a 10 million volt tower. And so you can get 10, uh, 10 divided by 350, you can get that much of the lightning strike in your 10 million volt tower. Now you have this 10 million volts that you have to disassemble down to a low voltage that you can use and plug into the grid. And so it's, it's just a really awkward energy to get at. Almost like tidal energy is awkward in the other way. It's, it's all movement and no pressure. And lightning is all pressure and little movement. Gary. So a minute ago, you mentioned a feedback loop. In the middle of your talk, you said there was a, a factor of about 20 to 1 that doesn't, isn't really explained by normal theory, I guess. Mm -hmm. So does that feedback loop answer the 20 to 1? Yes. Uh, Dwyer uh, presented numbers where his positronic feedback loop uh, easily uh, reaches the 20 to 1, whereas the normal uh, relativistic uh, runaway breakdown avalanche doesn't quite make it. And we see positrons come out, so may, maybe it matches the theory. I think there's still a lot of unknowns there. Well, I want to thank you um, for your presentation, and I uh, really encourage everyone to check out um, your three-letter domain. I think you could probably auction that off for what you need um, <laughs> for the rest of your project, just so you know. Um, the Lords of Discipline heavy metal band, I'm sure, are looking for it. Um, but uh, actually, actually, when I got this URL, I wanted LOD.com, but it was already taken. So I looked up who LOD.com was, and I ultimately figured out it was the Legion of Doom. <laughs> <laughs> and so I sent them an email saying, oh, hi, uh, I'm your uh, next door neighbor at LOD.org. Uh, uh, so you're the Legion of Doom, huh? And the guy was kind of like, yeah, that was us, but we've all grown up now. We have real jobs. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Unix consulting group. Of course it is. Um, so anyway, thank you, and I encourage everyone to check it out. And, uh, and hopefully we are going to uh, see this project um, both funded and then um, actually get to see it in real life and see if the obscure Russian... Uh, paper is the truly the answer once again. Um, uh, Greg's going to be around here to answer some more questions and then hopefully um, run some of the, uh, the tools in the back. And okay. Michael, do you have a, one more? Yeah, and, and you're, um, I think, Greg, as you're getting demos going of your, uh, of the 40-foot one, did you, do you want to say something about, uh, about that as that's coming up? Yeah, the plan is, uh, once I got the mobile app set up where I can actually bring it somewhere and run it, uh, I, I would like to do some demos, and uh, I'd like to invite specifically uh, the people here tonight to come see a demo. All right. And here's a long now challenge coin for all of our speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you again.